So, um, well, I uh, I uh, work at the or worked at the YMCA with Anne, um, and uh, you know, she told me that she worked at Memorial Blood Centers, and and I uh, that'd be a great opportunity for me. I'd love to come in and, and speak and, and see what I could offer. Um, and uh, then they were also doing a blood drive in one of the open, empty buildings uh, that's kind of right next to the Y downtown. And so I popped my head in there. I'm like, oh, I am Dan. I work with Dan. And, and again, I, like, I, I want to come in. I want to talk to you guys um, because I'm a blood recipient. And uh, it's, a, it's a story I haven't really told, one part of the story I haven't really told. So I'm really glad that I'm here to share that part of it today. Um, and just jump in. If there's people coming in, just, you know, I'm sure they can just squeeze in and find a seat. Um, so we get started. So February 1st of 2014, I was run over by a freight train. And um, obviously that's terrifying, um, but I'm doing very well. My recovery was very fast uh, and I'm back to doing a lot of the things that I did before. Uh, it's not easy, obviously, um, but I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for quick response and, uh, and available blood. So what you guys do is, is very important to me. Um, so what happened that night is I was under a lot of mental stress, um, personal stuff, so I won't get into it. Just know that I'm not crazy. I wasn't intoxicated. Uh, it was kind of a, a hell with the moon situation that went horribly wrong. Um, Laps and judgments. I was on Nicollet Island and this train came by and I jumped on and I fell. And so for the next 25 yards, the train dragged me as it ground down my legs until they finally snapped um, both legs below the knee. And it dropped me off, it let me go rather, um, just shy of a bridge, a railroad bridge that goes over the Mississippi River. You know, so had it held me on longer, this could have been very different. It might have been harder for EMTs to find me uh, or for me to get help. Um, so as, as, uh, as tragic as that was, um, I was lucky that I got help right away. I had a friend that was with me. He called 911 right away. Paramedics showed up. Um, I used my belt to try to make a tourniquet, but I only had one belt. So um, obviously that was a, a terrifying experience. Uh, so again, you know, I, I don't necessarily expect that anyone's going to understand uh, my motives or why I did what I did. Just know that uh, I'm not the first and I'm not the last. Um, just a brief history on train hopping. Uh, back in the, the Great Depression, lots of people would hop on freight trains to, to relocate. Um, they would take them from the country into the city to find work. And uh, I actually got a letter from a woman when I was in the hospital. Um, uh, she's part of the Minneapolis Hobo Society, which is an entire group of people that live a hobo cultured lifestyle. They make their own clothes, um, they grow their own food. Um, and when she heard about my story, she wrote me this letter and she said, you know, I've had so many people that I know throughout my life that have been injured by trains and I heard your story and it just broke my heart and just want you to know that we're thinking about you and she sent me a book to read and uh, and it really just kind of opened up my eyes because I never really thought about train accidents in that way before um, but you know now after being an amputee for a while and kind of learning and getting to know some of the community I've met several other people uh, one of the guys that works at the hardware store I go to on Nicolette um, is a unilateral blow the knee amputee that was run over by a train so there's just one per you know there's, there's actually two or three people that I've met in person um, who have been run over by trains. Um, so it's not entirely <coughs> uncommon. It doesn't happen as much uh, or for the same reason as it did back then, um, but it does still happen today. Uh, this is a photograph taken by a, um, uh, I believe he was 18 at the time, um, cross-country freight rider. He documented his entire trip um, coast to coast, showing everything. Um, So again, I, I get usually two responses when I tell people that I you know, lost my legs jumping on a train, and the first is, you know, why in the hell would you do that? And the second is, I've done that before, or I've heard that before, or I've met somebody who was injured that way. Um, 
And uh, so right now, for instance, a thousand people a day, uh, or sorry, a thousand people a year die uh, from train accidents, whether that's trespassing or car collisions, crossings, but a thousand people a year uh, is more than I thought it was. But then when you look at the map of how much railroads cross and zigzag all over our country, uh, we're bound to come into contact with them, even by accident at some point. Despite the danger, or perhaps because of it, there's something romantic, alluring, and exciting about hopping on trains. And we see this in media, films, um, magazines, things like that all the time. The image that comes into my head is young Bob Dylan, you know, playing guitar with a hobo, saying it with a sidecar open. Uh, but then also Mice and Men, old literature, uh, Indiana Jones, bank robberies, old westerns. We see this kind of thing a lot, and it makes it seem really exciting. And this is actually something that I had done before. Um, the uh, hometown that I grew up in, Delaware, Ohio, hosts the uh, Little Brown Jug, which is a harness racing event. And we used to hang out after school in town, and then we would walk the railroad track to the, the fair. And the trains were always going super slow, and back then, you know, I would just hop on the ladder, hang on to it for a minute, jump off, never really thought anything of it, just typical teenager. Um, and I never really thought that this is the kind of thing that would almost take my life. Uh, but as we know, trains are dangerous. This is something that, uh, that I know all too well. I, uh, I Dave did a speech for, uh, for the railroad not too long ago, and uh, well, it's, I guess it's over a year at this point now. Um, and afterwards, I had so many people come up to me and tell me, you know, that you know, they've had friends that have had, you know, just recently there was one on, uh, in Minneapolis that was a, a train casualty. Um, so, again, you know, understand I'm not first, I'm not the last, I'm just one of the lucky ones. Um, so anyway, I, uh, you know, after I, I was run over, I was laying in the snow and I called for my friend to call 911 and, um, I remember everything up until they actually put the mask on me in the uh, in the ambulance and gassed me until I finally passed out. And I woke up in the hospital and I actually don't even know how much longer afterwards it was that I woke up. Um, but you know, I was on morphine and all kinds of drugs and totally loopy and you know, my legs all bandaged and um, and it wasn't until much later that I found out, you know, that uh, uh, just how much blood I was given. Um, I found out that it was eight units of red blood cells about 325 milliliters each which is about 5.49 pints which is about 2.6 liters so to put that in perspective oh, <laughs> <laughs> 2.6 liters um, I'm a tall guy, and you know that's that's without my legs. So you can imagine that's the all that blood was gone. Um, but then, then I you know lost more than that, and that's what was put in me um, after they stopped the bleeding and, and got me bandaged up. And uh, you know, and I, I bought these the other day, and just just looking at them, I was like, that's a lot of blood. Um, so I, again, you know, if it wasn't for quick response, if it wasn't for available blood, um, then this would have ended very differently. Um, and I had a slide for this, but uh, I'll just tell you guys. Um, I was looking up some more statistics before I came in, and as far as train trespassing accidents, so not not crossings, not the vehicular, but um, trespassing <coughs> specifically, um, injuries in the United States told 419, and fatalities last year, uh, total 526. So 419 injuries, 526 fatalities. So what does that number tell you about train accidents, trespassing train accidents? Um, more people die than live from this. Um, you know, it's usually either further away from help um, or it's so traumatic that there just is no recovery. You know, that's something that's crossed my mind several times is that it cut me off down there, not here or here. 
Um, so that could have ended very differently. Uh, so again, people might not understand why I did it, um, but if there's an element of you that's a thrill seeker, and truly I believe that that's something that's in all of us, we've all been there, we've all engaged in risky behavior, um, and uh, you know, we get that in other ways. That could be extreme sports, that could be um, rock climbing, mountain biking, you know, skydiving, things like that. But we all like that element of danger. There's something that draws us to it. It's part of who we are. Um, and there are some people that can actually become addicted to that feeling. Um, this is actually a real photo, not photoshopped. This is a, a fad that started in Russia where these teens will climb these skyscrapers, um, find little access doors and break through them. And, um, and obviously very unsafe, no, no harness, no net. Um, this is all, this is something that happens. Um, so when you, when you compare that to what I did, it's, it's almost unfathomable, unfathomable that people will, will go to these extremes uh, for that little adrenaline rush. And we all know how pleasing that is. You know, you get that adrenaline rush and you feel like you can take on the world. Um, it's exciting, there's euphoria that follows. Uh, there's that, oh my God, I can't believe I just did that feeling. Um, and so this, you know, is, is a pretty interesting image. If you uh, if you're interested in seeing more of these, there's I mean, you Google this. There's there's tons of pictures. There's a lot of people that do this, and they've had fatalities, and there are people that still do it. Um, so again, we've all done something like this in our lives where we're not thinking about our safety, where we put ourselves in danger. Um, everyone's done it at some point. And that could be something where we're not fully evaluating the risk, like drinking and driving. You might think you're, you're okay. Oh, I'm not going very far, I've only had a few. Um, and it might not be your own safety that you're putting in danger with somebody else's. That uh, also could be texting and driving. It happens all the time. And uh, you know, so when you're thinking about risk assessment, I want you to think about things that you're doing and asking yourself, if I keep doing these things that are risky behavior that put myself or other people in danger, if I keep doing them, am I just playing chicken with the train? Because eventually, you know, that's, that's not going to end well. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I lifeguard uh, at, the, at the YMCA now. I work for the Minneapolis Parks and Recreation Board. Um, and I've written emergency action plans, and one of the things we do when we practice emergency scenarios is uh, as we talk about risk assessment, and how to cut down on your risk, and how to um, minimize distractions, especially as, as a lifeguard, that's super important. Uh, you know, part of our jobs <coughs> can get boring. You know, you're standing in a, on a pool, and if it's quiet, you're just, you're just standing there, and you're watching swimmers, and it can get boring, and you can daydream, and. Um, and it's, it's very important that we learn how to stay vigilant about safety and always keeping our eyes moving, always aware of what's going on in our pool area. Um, and I think that that mentality transfers over to a lot of other things, driving, you know, anything dangerous, basically, where we need to keep our alert, uh, um, we need where we need to keep alert and keep focused and be aware of all the dangers. So switching from talking about dangers and trains and whatnot. I want to talk more about what you guys do. So these are just some of the interesting things that popped up when I was looking around. Um, 4.5 million Americans would die each year without blood transfusions. That number was very large. I thought 4.5 million is a lot of people. Uh, and then I was thinking about, well, it's not all traumatic injuries. It's people, you know, uh, kidney failure. It's, it's medical problems. It's other things that happen. Um, approximately, you know, 32,000 pints of blood are used each day in the United States. Now I'm looking at these 2.6 liters and then I'm thinking 32,000 pints, that's a lot. Um, every three seconds. So you think about how often this happens and it's an ongoing thing. It's not something you ever really get rest from. Uh, so when you think about who you're helping, it's uh, people like me that are victims of traumatic injury 
um, cancer patients, anemics, uh, sickle cell patients, transplant patients, people in surgery. Um, and so when you look at statistics and you look at you know who you're helping, it's all very black and white. But I want you to think just a little bit further than that about specifically who you're helping, because that could be somebody's sister, could be somebody's father, somebody's grandma. Um, and it's it's easy to um, set aside time when it's something that you have to do to take care of yourself. You know, going to the dentist appointment, you know, every now and then they're like, oh, I haven't been in more than six months, so I should make an appointment. Um, and that's something that you do for yourself. And how often do we forget to do that? How often are we like, oh, it's been ages since I've been to the dentist. And giving blood is one of those things where it's not for you, it's, it's for someone else. It's something that we're all a part of. And it's really hard um, to kind of create a culture of awareness where people are thinking about Okay, there's all of these things that I put on my calendar to help myself, but what about all those things that I put on my calendar to help my community? And giving blood is one of those things. It's really hard um, for us to be empathetic in that way, to, to plan ahead about helping other people. Because we're not always thinking about that moment, you know, when we wake up and look in the mirror, thinking, oh, maybe, maybe I'll be the person who gives blood. Uh, and, you know, it's not all. Um, military and you know train accidents I, uh, I can't tell you how many times I get asked did you serve were you in the military you know people see my legs and they assume well, what other reason could there be and I, I have to educate these people it's like there's there's train accidents there's infections there's there's lawnmowers there's there's all kinds of reasons you can be born that way um, so I'm constantly educating people that it's not just you know military and, and, and train accidents that, you know, amputation, traumatic injuries, they happen a lot. And so there's a lot of people within that, uh, that scope that, that need blood. And, and we're not always thinking that someday it'll be us. Certainly I didn't. Um, so now it's kind of just a reminder for me, you know, I received blood. I, I obviously had a very clear reason that I needed it. Um, but you might be going along, you know, your daily life and not thinking about, you know, the day that you might actually need it. So when we have people come in and give blood, uh, usually we hope that the experience looks and feels like this. Uh, and for most people, I think it does. Uh, but there are a bunch of people that when they go to give blood, it feels like this. Uh, I Another statistic I found when I was looking this information up is that only 5% of Americans who can donate blood do. That's a really low number. You know, 5% um, people who can actually do. Um, you know, obviously, that should be a lot higher. And I think it goes back to when it's something that we're doing for ourselves, it's really easy to remember and put on our calendar. But when it's something we're doing for other people, especially something that involves needles and blood, um, people don't, no, don't necessarily want to do that. Um, <laughs> And so it's a real big challenge for you guys. Um, and so I'm sure that a lot of it is um, giving people a good experience when they do come and give blood so they don't feel like this. Uh, so that when they leave, they feel good about what they've done. And I think that comes down to, uh, to sharing your stories. Uh, sharing the stories of the people that you meet, uh, of the people who, who are giving blood, the stories that they should share with you about why they're giving blood. Um, share with them stories, you know, my story, other people's stories like mine that have received blood and are grateful for it. Remind them that what they're doing is helping so many people. Um, another statistic I found that is that every time you give blood, you can save up to three lives. So just once, three people that you're helping. Um, and, you know, blood is a renewable resource. It's not like we run out. So there shouldn't be a shortage. And, and so that's something that, you know, sticks with me a lot um, and you know when you're when you're helping people especially for instance in my situation you know I thought about had the train cut off my head you know my parents 
you know, would have gone to the funeral. They wouldn't have had any explanation for why I did what I did. I wouldn't have been able to say goodbye. I wouldn't have been able to tell, you know, tell them that I love them and all of those other things. And, um, and it would have, would have cut my life shorter than it needed to be. And, um, and so what you're doing there for people, like for instance, what I did, it was my own dumb mistake. I jumped on a train and I almost died from it. And, uh, but you know, I, I truly believe in second chances. And I think that moving forward, you know, all of the things that I've done since, I imagine, you know, not having those experiences or not having contributed that or not having the opportunity to do anything to give back. And so thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for what you do um, because you give people second chances and let them get back to the things that they want to do to get back on with their lives. Um, for instance, you know, I, I hula hoop before uh, my accident and I do it after too. It's great balance training, um, excellent balance training. Um, I also, you know, spin fire and, and staff and, and poi and stuff and it's not as dangerous as it sounds. <laughs> Um, but, you know, this is what you're doing. You're giving people the opportunity to get back to doing the things that they love. Um, it takes time and it takes practice. But I wouldn't have been able to do any of this, you know, if it wasn't for the people who responded, the, the blood that I got. Um, and, and, you know, and afterwards, just knowing that I was that I had received so much help uh, just pushed me to just keep going and seeing how far I could take it um, and sh you know within within one year after my accident you know I woke up in the hospital and I was thinking god I'm never going to lifeguard again you know, I teach swimming lessons how am I going to get back in the pool um, less than a year after my accident I recertified to lifeguard um, I am now the one of the aquatics managers for Minneapolis Parks and Rec and um, you know, just the opportunity to return to this, when I think about how quickly none of it could have happened. <coughs> you know, and I, uh, I also, another thing that I've done to kind of try to give back is I, um, I now coach adapted floor hockey and softball for uh, Wayzata Minnetonka High School. Um, so it's a, it's a varsity sport for um, kids with disabilities. And uh, we actually went to the state tournament uh, for floor hockey and softball. Um, but for softball, we won the consolation bracket. Um, so we got a nice little plaque. And, you know, so that was a definitely a, a high moment for me. It was, um, it was very nice to, to just kind of realize that, you know, when we finished that game, we won um, just this feeling of accomplishment and knowing that, you know, that. Um, that I had something to offer to that community. And, uh, you know, and again, I've said it, uh, repeated this a couple of times, but just how quickly or how easily I could have missed that opportunity. Um, so I want you to think about um, some of the mundane tasks that you do on a daily basis um, and how easy it can kind of be to get lost in that monotony of, you know, do this step, do that step, do that step, do that step, all very procedural. Um, and uh, just realize that the product that you're, that you're putting out, how many people it helps and how it helps them. And it's not just giving them blood, it's, it's giving them second chances. Um, so also I uh, wanted to share with you, I, I actually didn't know before, um, but I'm O positive, so I'm a universal donor, and uh, I, I didn't know that before, so I guess uh, I'll be paying it forward. Um, so please let me know when I can do that. I think, <laughs> yeah, don't worry. Yeah. I think that's one of those things, you know, 5% of people <coughs> who can give blood actually do, and part of it is, is they, they're not, you know, I feel like you guys might feel like you're you know, constantly reminding people, um, and 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 on the other side of it, I feel like they almost don't get reminded enough. Um, and and you know, I think it comes down to a personal responsibility, a community responsibility, um, to educate people on how how large this need is and how much it affects people and.
how important it is. Um, and I think that that just comes with sharing your stories, um, realizing how important what you do is. <coughs> and, you know, this is obviously is the experience that we want to have. This is you know, someone giving blood, happy to do it, happy to be there, um, happy to be a part of it. Um, and then also happy to facilitate it, happy to be there, um, being the one who's who's taking the blood and making sure that these people get the opportunity to help others. And uh, that is all I have for you today.